If you remember, just a week or so ago, we talked about worship based on the closing chapters of the book of Hebrews. Uh, the difference between worshiping at Sinai uh, in, with, with, the res, with, with the restrictive relationship to God based on law or worshiping in the heavenly Zion where love was the primary characteristic and where um, everything that God had done to that point meant to lead up to. And we emphasize the fact that in Hebrews chapter 12, we are told to worship God with reverence and awe. I mentioned at the time, every worship service has two elements in it. And one is adoration, worship through reverence and awe. The other is celebration, worship through praise and thanksgiving. The same chapter that talks about worshiping with reverence and awe also says, let us be thankful. And in the closing passage of Hebrews 13, which we looked at last week, we're told to bring a sacrifice of praise to God. So our lesson today, having concluded its study of Hebrews, takes this one week break at a very appropriate time for us to talk about praise and thanksgiving. For us to focus on uh, the biblical basis for what we're going to do as families and as a church and as a community and as a culture on Thursday of this week and in the days beyond that. Thanksgiving week is a great time to talk about praise and thanksgiving. But what's the difference between them? Are, are they synonymous? Is praise the same? as thanksgiving. Do you see any shades of difference? They're often linked. In fact, um, uh, not only in this, in the end of Hebrews that we've been studying are they linked. Think about passages like uh, the hundredth Psalm where it says, enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. The structure of that is a Hebrew parallelism uh, when, when we look at the poetic portions of the Old Testament, probably the key characteristic of Old Testament poetry is parallelism. Uh, OT poetry doesn't rhyme, wasn't meant to. Doesn't, it's not just that it doesn't rhyme when it's translated into English, that's almost always true from another language, but it does, was never meant to rhyme, it didn't rhyme in Hebrew. But the parallel structure of the lines is where the beauty of the poetry lay. So think about things like Psalm 19 where it says, the heavens declare the glory of God and the skies reveal his wonder. The heavens and the skies, the glory of God and the wonder of God. Uh, day unto day utters speech, night after night speaks knowledge. So you've got day after day and night after night. You've got uttering speech and speaking knowledge. And these are obviously intended to be parallel expressions, poetically. And so when uh, Psalm 100 says, enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise, we see in that that they're basically equating the two, or at least they're close enough so that this parallel structure is appropriate so that they can be paired together. And yet there are shades of difference. They're not exactly the same. How would, you, how would you differentiate between praise and thanksgiving? Maybe more than one way. You praise first and then you give thanks. Maybe the sequence. Maybe you first praise and then give thanks, Miriam says. Uh, so so that, that out of our praise comes our thanksgiving, perhaps. There's an idea. Other ideas? It almost seems like Thanksgiving is more of a tangible response. Okay. You're actually doing something. You're putting action to your praise and your gratitude, but you are actually giving literally thanks in some tangible form. Okay. So, Shannon.
Okay, so Shannon's point is out of praise comes thanksgiving, which is more tangible, maybe more specific, more precise, even thank you for more specific things. Uh, and, and we could look at it that way. Praise can also be precise. We praise you for this or that or the other. Um, they're really close. They're really close. And, and it would be interesting to consider whether you can have one without the other. Here's an idea. Maybe praise has to do with who God is and thanksgiving has to do with what he's done. So that in gratitude to God, we see his gifts to us. And in praise, we see the giver of the gifts. Now, that's not exactly everything either. We, you know, all, let's put all of these together and we probably will have a fuller picture of uh, the comparison between praise and thanksgiving. But I love a story that Ben Patterson tells. Ben Patterson is a large church pastor um, who... Uh, is a very gifted preacher and writer and and he says it like this imagine christmas day and a child opens a toy it's the doll that she wanted and she turns to her parents or her grandparents whoever gave the gift and she says thank you this is exactly what i wanted and then she looks at them again and says i love you so much Ben Patterson said there was thanksgiving for the gift, but there's praise for the giver, for the heart, for the love that produced the gift. Um, you are wonderful is the idea. And when we praise God out of love, then what we're saying to him is we see all of these gifts that you've given us. And Honestly, we don't see them all. But in gratitude, we thank you for them. And in praise, we say, you are wonderful. The giver of those gifts gives meaning and significance to the gift itself. Charles. There's an idea, uh, if you couldn't hear, Charles was saying, enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise may be a progression thing. We're getting closer to the Holy of Holies. We're coming more into the presence of Christ as well. All of this is good food for thought for us this week, between the turkey and the thanksgiving and the shopping, um, to think about the real purpose, the why behind the what, the who behind the why. Uh, of, of who God is and what he's done for us. So for our study this morning, let's, let's look at praise and let's look at thanksgiving. Um, Psalms is a great place to go to find God being praised. Uh, now, a lot of people would say the book of Psalms is a large book of praise. And uh, that's not wrong. But it misses the point that many of the Psalms are not actually praising as their primary purpose. Uh, some of the Psalms are, are Psalms of lament, Psalms of pain, Psalms of hurt, You're crying out to God, even with where are you kind of uh, meanings behind the words in those particular Psalms. But the thing about these, these psalms of complaint or of, or, or of pain or a lament, invariably they end in faith. Invariably they say, I can't see you, but I know you're there. You haven't come yet, but I know you will. Uh, there's always that note of faith that says, I trust you. Yes, I'm hurting. Yes, I feel loss. Yes, I feel pain. But I trust you you. Now, if we get, if we go to very uh, specific psalms of praise, the end of the book is the best place to go. From Psalms 146 to 150, 
there is a collection of psalms that all begin with the same word. Hallelujah. And they all end with the same word. Hallelujah. So if you look at Psalm 146, 147, 148, 149, and 150, each one begins hallelujah and ends hallelujah. These are praise psalms without question. And of course, hallelujah in our English translations is translated what? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And so each psalm begins praise the Lord and it ends praise the Lord. Scripture doesn't call on us to praise God because God needs to hear it. Um, he, he isn't an insecure child who needs to be constantly reminded how great he is. He isn't a tyrant who demands that we constantly come before him and tell him how great he is. God doesn't need, God knows how great he is. But God knows that we need to know. And praise, while directed to God, is from his intention in the beginning for our good. So that we can remind ourselves we didn't deserve all that we have. But we have it. Um, in, in previous years at Thanksgiving, I remember I've mentioned this, so forgive me for repetition. But I can't get over that uh, uh, Jim, Jimmy Stewart movie, Shenandoah, where the family's sitting around the table and they call on him to pray the prayer of Thanksgiving. And his prayer is something like this, Lord, we worked this land, we planted it, we plowed it, plowed it, we planted it, and we harvested it. If we hadn't done it, we wouldn't have it. Amen. That was, that, was his, that was his prayer of thanksgiving. And we laugh at that because we know how ludicrous it really is. Everything we have comes from him. And, and we need to remember that. Praise helps us remember that. Praise helps us keep things in perspective. It's not all about us. It's all about him. Praise helps us keep our values in focus we are not the most important thing here he is the most important one here and it reminds us of our dependence on him without him we have nothing and we are nothing it's all about him and when we praise him we're reminding ourselves of that now praise is outward directed it's given to God but the reason God calls for it is because he knows of its effect on us. Uh, there were two hymns written that the church loves to sing entitled To God Be the Glory. First one was written by Fanny Crosby 150 years ago. To God be the glory, great things he has done. So loved he the world that he gave his own son, who yielded his life in atonement for sin and opened the life gate that all may go in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. You know that hymn. Um, Fanny Crosby's blind, you know. Never inhibited her praise. I don't think she ever thought about it in terms of her relationship to God. She saw what we couldn't see, I think, many times. And not with her physical eyes. But that's a beautiful hymn of praise. And if we flash forward a century, we get Andre Crouch, who wrote a song called My Tribute, and the parenthesis is To God Be the Glory. Andre Crouch, African-American, son of a preacher, um, magnificent music career, acclaimed around the world, and yet he said, it's all about God. To God be the glory. Um, you remember how his song begins? How can I say thanks for the things you've done for me? And then he goes on to say, to God be the glory. 
Now, that, that phrase, to God be the glory, is just another way of expressing praise, isn't it? Um, where does the glory go? Does the glory go here or does the glory go there? Is a very real question. The um, a musical genius, uh, Johann Sebastian Bach, used to write at the bottom of his musical pieces, S-D-G. Soli Deo Gratia, uh, Gloria. To God alone be the glory. And so he composed some of the most beautiful music the world's ever known. And he said with each one, glory goes to God and not to me. Rockley, would you do me a favor? Up in the sound booth, there is a uh, little blanket I'd like for you to bring down, would you? It's over on a chair, on that back corner. In chapel, Southern Wesleyan, a few years ago, we did a series on the Lord's Prayer. And I had one of the assignments. It was uh, to speak about, uh, for thine be the kingdom and the power and the glory. And not being of sound mind, the way that I started, thank you. The way, the way that I started was to welcome everybody to the kingdom of Bob. Uh, I, now, I admitted that the, the population of this kingdom was very small. Currently, it stood at one. But they were welcome to join if they could abide by the rules and regulations of the kingdom of Bob. Uh, first of all, there's a dress code, blue blazers for everybody. <laughs> if the masters can hand out green coats, I can hand out blue coats, okay? so. Um, also, a soft drink of choice is Diet Cokes. Everybody had to switch to Diet Cokes. Uh, they had to cheer for the UNC Tar Heels, which in football season is really hard to do, but basketball season is on its way. You had to immerse yourself in all the Peter Sellers Pink Panther movies so that you could shout out the funniest lines at the appropriate time when they came on the screen. And you had to learn the words to folk songs from the 1960s. And if you did that, then you could be uh, a citizen in the kingdom of Bob, and every citizen in the kingdom of Bob gets this. Isn't this wonderful? If I can get it unraveled here. Can you see? Ev everybody, everybody in the kingdom can have one of these. Don't you all want to be in this kingdom? To which everybody shouted, please no. Hey, everybody does live in a kingdom. By the way, that's a real throw that I got for Christmas one year. Everybody does live in a kingdom. The question is, which kingdom are you living in? And, and I'll tell you the litmus test, where does your praise go? Because if it's the kingdom of me, that's where the praise goes. Or to use Fanny Crosby and Andre Crouch's terms, that's where the glory goes. Um, Sola Bob Gloria doesn't work. Sola Deo Gloria does. And, and if we recognize that, if we can say to God, yours is the kingdom and yours is the power and yours is the glory and mean it, then that's the truest praise. That's from the heart. And, and so in, this, in, a, in, a, in a, any church service, we're engaged in praise and thanksgiving. But at this particular time of the year, it's, it's especially important for us, I think, to think about which kingdom we're in and to determine it by where the praise and glory goes. Which leads to thanksgiving. Uh, Luke 17, we have one of the most incredible stories in the scripture. Remember the story of the ten lepers who asked Jesus for healing? And he sent them on their way to the priest because the priest was the one who had to verify that they were whole, if they were. And as they went, beautiful, 
beautiful uh, lesson on obedience. As they went, they were healed. And then scripture says one came back to say thank you. Now, were the other ten not grateful? Well, I'm, I'm sure they were grateful in a sense. They didn't express it. And that gratitude probably stayed within their own kingdom and didn't get where it was supposed to go. One came back to say thanks. If that story seems far-fetched to us, let me give you a modern story. It was about 20 years ago in the winter in Chicago, a ship coming in went down in Lake Michigan within sight of the shore, but it was in the winter and the water was freezing. And people without life jackets were floundering in the water. A young man on the shore saw it, stripped off his jacket and his shoes and dove into the water and saved one after another after another. 17 people he pulled to safety. 17 who would have frozen or drowned or both in that water. 17 people. He was hospitalized with hypothermia and the Chicago Tribune came to do a story and the writer said uh, one of the things I'm interested in what have you heard from the people that you saved and the young man said nothing and the writer said well how many have come by to see you and he said none he saved their lives at the risk of his own he's hospitalized and they're going on with their lives and nobody said thank you now I go back to Jesus' story and I say that can happen in fact we can be that person if we're not careful we can be that person who just absorbs all the good that comes from God and doesn't stop to give him the glory praise and to express gratitude thanksgiving for who he is and what he has done. Um, last Sunday, I think, we sang the hymn, Now Thank We All Our God, with hearts and hands and voices. That was written in um, the midst of the Thirty Years' War in 17th century Europe by a man named Martin Rinkert, a local pastor whose village had been devastated by the war. Uh, Thirty Years' War was one of the most destructive wars for the civilian population uh, in, in history. And the reason was that uh, the armies, and they were Catholic armies and Protestant armies, after the Reformation, the uh, Catholic Church tried to destroy the Reformation militarily. And so Catholic and Protestant armies are, are fighting all over Northern Europe for 30 years. And the armies are told, we have no pay for you, take what you can from the people. And so if you're in the civilian population, what happens to you? Your livestock is taken. Uh, the, the, the grain in your storehouse is taken. The, the, the vegetables in your garden become food for the army and if not that army the next army because one was as bad as the other and so the, the people are destitute and in the midst of that their pastor said it's Thanksgiving we'll write a hymn of praise to God now thank we all our God uh, Martin Rinker didn't see a reason not to praise God in bad times because he had a view past the immediate to the eternal and and looking back on who God was and what he had done in the past and looking forward as well he wrote one of the most beautiful Thanksgiving hymns that we have not written in easy times and maybe that's why it's such a beautiful hymn um, but out of his own sense of desolation and desperation. He's still praising God and thanking God for who he is. This is a, 
I think a really good reminder that that verse in scripture doesn't say be thankful for all things. It says be thankful in all things. And bad things happen. And I don't have to tell you that. Bad things happen. And calling them good won't change them. They're bad things. Scripture knows they're bad. God knows they're bad. Uh, this, it, Genesis 3 is still in effect. We are under the fall and bad things happen. And bad things happen to good people. But in all things, we can still give thanks. Because God has more in store for us beyond the deprivation of the immediate for us. Uh, Matthew Henry Matthew Henry was a Puritan in England about the time that the Pilgrim Puritans came over to America. Matthew Henry got mugged, we would say, one day. He was accosted on the street by a thief who took his money. And this is what he wrote in his diary. Let me read you this. Let me be thankful. First, because I've never been robbed before. Second, although they took my money, they did not take my life. Third, because they, uh, although they took everything I had, it wasn't much. <laughs> and fourth, because it was I who was robbed and not I who robbed. What, what an insight that is. And he found abundant room for praise in, in something that we would still be moaning over and feeling sorry for ourselves about. Bring the sacrifice of praise, Hebrews says. Psalm says there's a sacrifice of thanksgiving. Again, almost identical words. But think about the word sacrifice. That will cost us something. To truly praise and to truly be thankful costs us something. What does it cost us? Maybe more than I'm thinking right now, but at least it costs us the credit. This is not my doing. What I have <clears throat> came from a greater hand than mine. What I experience, good or bad, is part of a larger plan that I can't see the end of. But I know who can. It's that Corey Ten Boom story about the tapestry, and we're looking at the rough side of it, where all the knots are and the tangles. But there is another side to that tapestry. And when we see it, we will be overflowing with praise and gratitude. Why not now? Because now says, I can't see it yet, but I believe it. I can't see it yet, but I trust. Can't see it yet, but that's where faith kicks in. I know that it's there. And so I will give you praise, and I will give you thanksgiving, and how about this? I will give you obedience, like we heard in the sermon this morning, which in many ways is the highest praise of all. I will do what you say, because you loved me first, I love you back, and I trust you with everything that I have. Thanksgiving thoughts or praise thoughts from you? Yes. Yeah. 
Beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. Shannon, if you couldn't hear, she was saying that at Potter's Place there was just a sense of oppression or uh, spiritual heaviness until she recruited, based on that scripture, she recruited people to just march the grounds and praise the Lord. Not petition, but praise. Just give him thanks and give him, give him praise. And God answered. That's a powerful testimony. Charles. A tes absolutely testimony of in the darkest of times medically when his life was in the balance God came through and gave him a life first I've, I've heard so many people have have similar stories uh, Virgil Mitchell said that after his heart attack when his, his life looked like it might be slipping away the, the verse that the Lord gave him was this is the day the Lord has made I will rejoice and be glad in it. He said, I did not understand that at all, but I practiced it, and it worked. Uh, it it not, not just worked in that God gave him healing. He could have gone on to heaven, it would have worked, because it's a recognition of whose kingdom it is and whose glory it's all about. Well, as you celebrate in a culture that doesn't understand this, folks, um, this is one place where maybe that light should come out from under the bushel and, and an, an unbelieving world can see what it means for God's people who have taken hits, don't get me wrong, to still give praise and glory to God. Let's pray. Lord, we know a sacrifice of praise can cost us something. But if it costs us everything, it is still so worth it. We thank you, not only for what you have done, but we praise you 
for who you are. You're a generous God, but that comes out of a heart of love that we are most grateful for. And help us to reflect that in our own relationships with others. May we practice obedience as well as give gratitude to you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.